Thank you. When we last met a few years ago, this is what the world of thoracic genetic aneurysm looked like. We had Marfan syndrome, well known due to fibrillin 1 mutations. We were beginning to appreciate Lewis Dietz syndrome with TGF beta receptor mutations. And we had a grab bag of mutations associated with familial thoracic aortic aneurysm disease. And then, of course, we had our old friend bicuspid aortic valve, by far the biggest clinical load. We were struggling to understand the genetics of that, and we still are. But in 2018, the landscape has evolved. The first thing to notice is that there are many more genes involved. The list has grown considerably and continues to do so. <coughs> Secondly, we can now group the pathogenic mutations into functional classes, those associated with the TGF beta signaling pathway, those associated with the microfibrils in the extracellular matrix, and those associated with the smooth muscle cell contractile apparatus. In the clinic, when we take a person with non-syndromal, i.e. non-Marfan, non lois Dietz, non-BAV, familial aneurysm, and we look at their genetic makeup, we will only find a mutation in 25% of cases at present. Three out of four, we don't yet find anything. <coughs> the commonest descriptor is for ACTA2 mutations, smooth muscle cell actin, accounts for about one in eight familial non-syndromic <coughs> TAD. TGF beta receptors are rarer, and the vast majority of these remaining mutations appear to be less common. This is the current state of our knowledge of the genetics underlying familial TAD. I would stress that this is based upon a North American population, and these prevalences may vary in other populations. Now, I want to just share with you some key insights into how these mutations can lead to thoracic aneurysms. The first key concept is that the vascular smooth muscle cells can exist in two forms, a contractile form or a benign or good form and a synthetic form which is the malign or not good form. There is a very important feedback that occurs between the microfibrillar structure in the extracellular matrix and the endothelial cells and the vascular smooth muscle cells. In essence, the microfibrillar structure acts as a mechanosensor of wall stress on the aorta. And there is a feedback mediated via TGF beta, the integrins and vascular smooth muscle cell contractile apparatus, which modulates the response of the vascular smooth muscle cells to wall stress. And you can see that mutations in the TGF beta receptor signaling, mutations in fibrillin, and a number of the other ones that we identified clinically are associated with disruption of this conversation. As a result, the vascular smooth muscle cells change phenotype from the normal contractile phenotype to an abnormal synthetic phenotype with release of matrix metalloproteinases and extracellular proteins, and that leads to the adverse remodeling of the aortic wall. The second key concept I want to leave you with today is that angiotensin II is a yin-yang phenomenon on the remodeling of the arterial wall. We are all familiar with the role of angiotensin II leading to vasoconstriction and vascular cell hypertrophy, predominantly through signaling via the AT1 receptor. However, less well appreciated is the role of other angiotensin metabolites, notably ANG19 and ANG17 from ACE2 and neprilysin, particularly signaling through the mass receptor, leading to the opposite effects of vasodilatation and stability of the aortic wall. So, the use of ACE inhibitors in these patients may shoot us in the foot because we are blocking out potential beneficial effects, whereas angiotensin receptor blockers may help skew angiotensin metabolism towards the beneficial and away from the detrimental. The third key pathophysiological concept I want to leave you with is the role of epigenetics. We have recognised for a long time that individuals may share the same underlying mutation but have a very different clinical course. 
One of the reasons for this is epigenetics. TET2 is an important enzyme modulating high 5 hydroxymethylcytosine effects on the promoters of key genes involved in vascular smooth muscle cell phenotype. And essentially, TET2 is a good guy which helps switch vascular smooth muscle phenotype from synthetic towards contractile. If I knock out TET2 in a murine model, I will make aneurysm formation in response to angiotensin infusion much worse, associated with disruption of the vascular architecture. So we now understand, compared to three years ago, the broad spectrum of mutations that can lead to this, affecting the mechanotransduction and structure of the arterial wall. And we are beginning to gain insights into how those adverse effects are modulated by other factors, such as epigenetics. On the clinical front, this, these disorders are far more prevalent than we used to think they were. We used to think that if you presented with an aortic aneurysm at 50 years of age, it was due to degeneration or hypertension. That is not true. This shows the distribution of the different pathologies underlying patients presenting with thoracic aortic aneurysm and dissection. And you can see the degenerative disease and atherosclerosis shown in the dark colours only really become a factor after 60 years of age. And even in the seventh and even the eighth decades, congenital or sorry, not congenital, genetic causes remain significant underlying factors. The second key thing, the presentation of the non-syndromal genetic disorders occurs later than the classic ones like Marfan syndrome, often not appearing until midlife. So you may need to follow patients up for a significant number of years. If we take patients presenting with an apparent sporadic aneurysm, approximately one in four of them will have a known family history. That's fine. But when you look through the family, even though they knew they had a disorder, you will find for every one that was a known affected relative, you will find at least one new affected relative. Even more importantly, in those families with no known history, if you screen the relatives, in at least half the cases, you will find other affected people. The moral of the story is that everybody presenting, even with an isolated thoracic aortic aneurysm, should have at least their first degree relatives screened. These disorders extend beyond the vascular system. We have evidence of small vessel disease in telangiectasia. We can have cerebral aneurysms. We can have emphysema. We can have early onset osteoarthritis. The appearance of varicose veins in young people, particularly young males, is a signal thing, particularly for TGF beta receptor mutations. The corollary is that if you have people presenting with these disorders, and particularly people presenting with subarachnoid hemorrhage, you must look at their aorta. These extravascular conditions are not benign. As an example, the impaired ventricular contractility of Marfan syndrome. There is a Marfan cardiomyopathy that is manifest in approximately 25% of patients it is associated with ventricular dilatation and depressed contractility of the ventricle. You can see it in a murine model. We can see it in humans where there is reduced end systolic elastance and abnormal ventricular vascular coupling. Now, heart failure and sudden death due to ventricular arrhythmias rival type A aortic dissection as the causes of death in patients with Marfan syndrome. Do the mutations themselves tell us anything about the risk of out adverse outcomes and prognosis? This shows the risk of having an aortic dissection if you have a non missense mutation in Marfan syndrome, i.e. a mutation which results in truncation of the protein or a major frame shift as opposed to a simple point mutation. You will see that as I move from the amino terminus towards the carboxy terminus, if I have a non missense mutation at the amino terminus end of the protein, my risk of having a dissection is much greater than it is if I have a mutation elsewhere. Please note these survival curves are actually mislabeled. This is the non missense and this is the missense. This is the combined adverse endpoint of death, dissection, or surgery, according to whether or not you have a missense or a non-missense mutation in Marfan. 
Those shown in brown, which are the non-miss scents, have a much worse prognosis than shown in miss scents. So we now have evidence that the type of mutation can help guide your clinical decision making and risk stratification. What about Lewis Dietz syndrome? This shows the outcomes and survival for patients with TGF beta 1 receptor and TGF beta 2 receptor mutations. Overall, the survival for patients with Lewis Dietz syndrome is more aggressive than it is for Marfan syndrome. But please note, in those with a TGF beta 1 receptor mutation, if you are a female, you do better than if you are a male. We do not know the reason for that. For the TGF beta 2 receptor mutations, you do equally badly. The TGF beta 2 receptions are more common than the TGF beta receptor 1 mutations. What about ACTA2? We see the same thing in ACTA2. Overall, the lifetime risk of having something bad happen to your aorta if you have an ACTA2 mutation is 76%. However, some mutations, such as the R179, are associated with a much more aggressive course, and others, such as the 185Q, are associated with a less aggressive course. This is early days. But we are now starting to find that the evidence base from the genetic mutation type can inform our clinical decision making and risk stratification for patients. What about our prediction of risk according to the size of the aorta? In Marfan syndrome, there is a relationship between aortic size and risk of dissection, shown in red. However, in patients with non-syndromal TAD, that relationship is much weaker. And if you have Lewis Dietz syndrome, there is no relationship between aortic size and the risk of dissection. So in summary, the universe of genetic aortic disease is rapidly expanding. We are now understanding better the spectrum of causative mutations and the potential pathways for the pathophysiology of aneurysm formation. And as we better decipher those pathways, we will identify new treatment targets and potentially render unnecessary the surgical and catheter interventions we're talking about today. Thank you. Wish me just one qu uh, quick question while you're there. Um, you talked a little of the uh, non-aortic uh, diseases that are, that are related, perhaps, and most of them seem to be aneurysmal. What about, is there any relationship between the familial aortopathies and, say, the spontaneous coronary dissections we see in the cath lab fairly regularly, which are non-aneurysmal, they appear to be relatively uh, normal arteries? There, there's no defined <laughs> relationship between SCAD and any of the large vessel genetic aortopathies. The only thing amongst the large vessel aortopathies that's been shown to be involved with the coronaries is the ACTA2 mutations, which are associated with Moya Moya disease and with premature coronary disease. Good, thank you very much, and thank you for staying on time to the, the, all those speakers who've been, uh, who've spoken so far.